This story is inspired from the viral clip posted by a TikTok user, Wonder Woman 1. She was all alone at home, but was shocked to see a stranger sitting beside her. The interesting part was that this other person was only visible in her TV screen. The following is an animated version of the same. You never know you have a story to tell until it occurs to you, or the story happens to you and you have to tell it. I was in the police station with Vivian, and without telling my story, I knew they would say I was mad. So far, only one person believed me, and that was Vivian. It didn't matter that she was the only one I had told. The encounter that sent me to the station with my best friend happened in a jiffy. I could barely believe myself anymore. I was at a stage where I recounted if I was only imagining it or if it actually happened. I happened to be on the night shift at my workplace. I wasn't a huge fan of night shifts because I was an early sleeper and an early riser, and doing the night shifts usually messed with my sleeping mechanism. However, I had no choice but to serve nights for a month after every two months. I clocked out of work by 5 a.m. and returned home. The good thing about the night shift I had was the holiday that came with it the next day. The day happened to be my holiday for the week. I got home, ate a little, crashed into bed, and caught a quick sleep. A quick sleep because I was awake in less than three hours after I slept. It wasn't abnormal. That's what I meant by night shifts meddling with my sleeping routine. When I woke up, I decided to spend my morning watching TV. I jumped in front of the set after grabbing some snacks from the fridge. I snuggled my pillow as my favorite show started. I was blushing in excitement, laughing at the funny scenes and releasing my emotions, but it didn't last for long. The TV screen went off abruptly. It was blank. I tried to push the buttons on my remote in an attempt to turn it back on, but nothing happened. It was my day off work and I was too tired to get up from my place and check the TV. I sat there munching the snacks. I could see my reflection in the blank screen, and that was normal. The unusual thing was beside me. I could also see the reflection of another person. I couldn't make out their face. I couldn't make out if they were male or female either. I thought it was only my imagination and I didn't react at first. Every other second I glanced over my shoulder to see if anyone was lurking in any corner of the house, but I didn't see anything. The bad thing was I was afraid and the worst part was that I didn't dare to stand up or move away from where I sat in front of the television set. I was supposed to be the only one in the house. I didn't share the house with anyone, and I didn't expect anyone to be with me. More so, it was morning and most of the neighbors were supposed to be at work. I wasn't even someone who mixed with my neighbors, and they never visited my house. At some point, I clung to my phone in the TV remote while staring hard at the television. I closed my eyes, hoping that this was all a game which my subconscious mind was playing. After all, I was an anxious person by nature. I hoped that when I opened my eyes back, things would be normal. After a few seconds, I slowly opened my eyes and when I looked in the TV screen, the person was still there. This time, they were clutching a knife with their eyes fixed on my neck. I shivered in my position and goosebumps were scattered on my frail skin. I lost control and sprung back as I shouted, Who is there? I tried to summon courage. I held onto my phone, stood up, and walked to the back of the sofa where I sat. I took small steps around the house, flapping curtains and checking under the table and behind the doors. By that time, I was holding a rod I found in the kitchen. The check around the house confirmed that there was no one around, but as soon as I returned back to my couch, the reflection of the person was still there with the knife aimed at me, staring into my neck. I fidgeted and screamed out, but the echoes of my scream rushed back at me. I was clueless, wondering who was haunting me in this manner. I stood up once more and did another search, but there wasn't anyone. No one. I was thinking of going back to the couch, but a sharp blade caught my neck, pinching my skin. I turned slowly to catch a glimpse, but the feeling faded and there was nothing around me. I screamed, soaked in utmost fear. I ran out of the house and took a cab to my best friend Vivian's house. Vivian was surprised to see me. I couldn't blame her. We fought the day before, and being the snob I was, I hadn't been talking to her. The scenario that played out in my house was enough to let me forgive her and seek refuge in her house. I narrated the story to her after giving myself some breathing space. 
She was sympathetic and believed every word I said. That was when she said we should go to the police station and report what I saw. I didn't want to go because I had started to doubt my own story. It felt surreal and impossible, but Vivian was adamant. She said the person could be a serial killer on the loose and the officers had a right to know that a criminal was in town. I asked if there was a possibility that what I saw was a vengeful ghost or a shadow person. I heard that ghosts who died unfairly tried to take revenge on anyone possible. I had also read about shadow people on the internet. But Vivian dismissed both the ideas and drove me to the station herself. The police officers believed my story to my surprise. They offered to follow me to my house and check around. I agreed and we were at my house in a matter of a few minutes. As expected, everything was in order at my place. There was no one to be found. After preambulating and investigating the scene, the look in the eyes of the officers convinced me that they thought I was mad like I initially thought they would. One of them didn't hide it when he said I should get myself checked. They left disappointed and I was scared, but Vivian tried to cheer me up. I left the house the next day and went to Vivian's house. I knew I would be safe in the company of my best friend and finally at peace. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> a myth surrounded my place of work, and it had something to do with nighttime. I was never one to believe in myths because I considered them as stories that people used to make others cower in fear. It didn't make sense as long as one was courageous enough to live life like a boss. I was on the night shift at the 24-hour library, and being a book freak myself, I didn't mind. I have been interested in books since I was much younger, and my mother said I never went to sleep if I didn't read at least two books. She said I didn't allow her to read them to me, but I chose to read the books myself. Perhaps reading books was part of the reason that myths felt surreal to me and more like fiction. The library wasn't so busy, but there were still some students around. Most of them had exams to take, and others were just studious or book freaks like me. I decided to bury myself in a book too since all I had to do was make sure no one left the library with any books without signing. It didn't look like anyone would do that. I stood from where I sat at the counter and skimmed through the bookshelves for the perfect book. That was when the library myth came to my mind. People, librarians and library users there were fond of saying that there was a particular book that had a ghost attached to it. Anyone who picked the book or even as much as touched it or attempted to remove it from the shelf was haunted by a ghost. Some said it happened for the rest of the person's lives. Others said the ghost haunted the person for 24 hours. It was believed that the ghost guarding the book was its author. Something about the author dying and his book got published after his death. But because he didn't want anyone to read what he wrote, he guarded it. I didn't believe it. How many copies could he guard? Or was there only one copy which existed? I observed that no one touched the book. No one ever moved closer to it, and the cleaners never cleaned it either. I was sure because when I got to the book's position, it was dusty and the book was lying alone on the shelf. My curiosity got the best of me, and I detached the book from the shelf. It wasn't as hard as I supposed it would be. One would think that a book guarded by a ghost would need at least a little bit of momentum to even touch it. I removed the book with no stress, and at that moment I knew the myth couldn't be true. I dusted the book and removed every speck of dirt. What improper treatment of a good book. It was a novel, a title I had never heard of or seen except in the myth people told. I took the book with me back to the counter and settled into reading through the night. It was a thriller about a serial killer who took pleasure in killing young ladies after they fell in love with him. The book was oddly satisfying and I felt bad that everyone was missing out because of the horrible myths surrounding the book. As the duration of my shift came to an end, I was done with the book. I returned it to the shelf as the next librarian took over. I made sure to clean the shelf. I went back to rattle off to my replacement that I had read the book, returned it, and I was still perfectly fine. She shrugged and didn't say anything to counter what I had done. I figured my bravery was making her finally doubt the book ghost, and that was my goal. I left the library and drove to my house. It was still dark, but my eyes were tired from reading and staying awake all night. All I wanted to do was sleep after a refreshing shower. I entered my house, 
removed my clothes and entered the bathroom. I brushed my teeth, used the toilet, and finally entered the bathtub. But instead of peace, I started to hear gibberish whispers, subtle, silent whispers directly in my ears. I could almost feel the breath of the mouth that spoke the words. I looked around, even with the perfect understanding that no one was with me in the bathroom. Of course, I didn't see anyone. I turned back to scrubbing my body, dismissing the feeling that overpowered me in those whispers. It wasn't many seconds later when I heard the whispers again. The words made sense this time. Love doesn't always last. Life doesn't either. My head banged as I realized where I had heard, or rather seen that line. It was in the book I read that night, the book people claimed was guarded by a ghost. The sentence was one that the serial killer in the book said every time he killed his next victim. The women that he seduced and made to love him. The women he slowly killed when they wanted to break up with him. I found it cool when I was reading the book, but hearing the words in my ears in the bathroom made me change my mind. For the first time in all 30 years of my life, fear enveloped me like a blanket. I rinsed my body fast. I concluded in my mind that I was only having hallucinations as an after effect of the book. I blocked out every inkling that pointed towards the obvious, the fact that the myth might have contained an iota of truth. I stepped out and came face to face with my mirror. Written in red letters on the glass mirror were the same words I heard in my ears. I would have screamed if I wasn't so frozen in place and unable to move any part of my body. If anyone had told me that I was mad, I would have believed it, because it felt like a better explanation than the myth being true. It couldn't be true. It shouldn't be true. I clicked my mind into action, washed off the letters from the mirror, and exited the bathroom. I found my pajamas and climbed under my blanket, seeking some form of comfort. But that spooky presence was everywhere. The whispers, the voice, the words. I cowered under my sheets. I started to regret my decision to read the book. My head spun in its position and my eyes were dizzy. I didn't know when sleep took me off, but I knew I slept because I woke up in the afternoon. I wanted to believe my ordeal would end that day. I desperately believed the people that claimed the ghost haunted for only a day. Not the ones that thought it was for the entire life of the person. The eerie presence in my house was gone. And when I regained my sanity, I resigned from the library and started to believe in myths too. Perhaps they were true sometimes. I had my bets placed on silence. The tension in the air was palpable to the smell of the wind in the room that was stiff, clammy, and almost crude. I had a cigarette between my fingers, awkwardly twisting the butt ever so often as I imagined smokers would. I had placed it on my lips a couple times, and each time it left a moist char in my mouth. I loathed the aroma of it, but it was necessary for my appearance. I was in a bar after all. The men in there were loud, lewd, and intentionally provocative in more instances than I could care to count. I had maintained a defying silence, even after one of them had threatened to wash me in his glass of beer, a rather tall one, I might add. I had simply looked away from the man's face, memorizing his features in the dizzying atmosphere and simpered. He was stout, standing no taller than five feet nine inches. Perhaps it was this realization of his stature that made him compensate with an attitude towards a woman like me. Or maybe it was the fact that I was dressed, which is no excuse in any case to deflect from my purpose. I had disguised my looks with a colorful wig. I had gone generously as far as I could with my lipstick. I had chosen a pink shirt that exposed my navel and a reddish skirt to match it. It suited my personality that I tried to channel, or so I thought. In any way, I didn't care too much for such things because I should have known better than the tight leather boots that I had chosen for the night that pinched terribly. The augury of terrible things to come was in the rowdiness of the crowd, and they had a lot to cheer about. It was Independence Eve, 
One of the times that most of the nation could all agree that we were indeed the greatest country on earth and the only night of my life when hell visited earth at whim. I turned my eyes away from the intermittent cheers and stared at the whitest trail of smoke that snaked from the burning tobacco. It was almost time and the pendulum in my head had started to swing back and forth between clarity and unrighteous thoughts. I steadied myself by gripping tightly to the edge of the table and took in long draws of breath. I had looked through the crowd once, and there he was, the same man who had threatened to wash me in his beer. The sickening realization rippled through me, and I was queasy from the smell of the cigarette. I lifted the butt of the cigarette to my mouth and took a long drawn puff. I choked on the swirling sensations that ascended through my tight canal of mouth and into my nostrils. My left hand instinctively flew to my mouth and I coughed lightly. I turned the cigarette and stuck the embers into the steel ashtray, watching it quench out noiselessly. But I exhaled the rest of the smoke and climbed down from the elevated bar stool. I took another furtive look at him and recognized the look in his eyes. I had grown all too familiar with it by this time in my life. I scrambled through the crowd as seductively as I could, and for every inch of my stride, I noticed his eyes on me. He was the chosen one, and I had no qualms with that. I had driven miles from my city just for that moment, and he had given it to me with no dent to my conscience. He stood up when I was by the door, and I sighed, flustered. I pushed the door from the bar open, and the late night wind crashed against my face with a refreshing aroma of unshackling. I stared up at the morbid sky, the moon and the clouds engaging in a game of cloak and reveal. It was time. Hey, bitch! I heard his voice, a distinct granting noise traveling through the cool hours of midnight. I maintained my silence and kept on with my trek, luring him on. I perceived he followed me because the heat of the company trailed behind me. I did not want to turn around. It was unnecessary to startle him. He would come to me. And he did, just as I thought. He bowed his time just as I imagined he would. He stole as stealthily as he could, trailing me out of the vehicle lit road and off to the path alleyway that led to the other side of the building. I made a bend and he suddenly picked up his pace, fearing that I would get away from him. I kept on my track, masked by the steady blackness that colored the alleyway. My breath was shaky and I wished that I had a cigarette by me. For some reason, it had made me still. And now, without it, I was a wreck of nerves. I heard his footsteps when he made the turn as well, burning with lust perhaps, because his heaving breath betrayed his position even when his feet were light on the ground. I merged into the darkness and waited on him as he walked past me. How did she get away? He cussed in a long stream of annoyance. His words were slurred, heavy with an alcoholic draw. I hesitated watching him. Just as he made his way past me, I emerged, slipping out of the darkness in which I had been the entire time with a knife to his neck. Hello, I whispered, catching a glint of the knife as it reflected off the moon. All of my victims had been the same, men driven out by lust for violence against women. My purpose was simple. Men who showed dangerous disposition to harmless women deserved to die. The last time I counted, the number stood at 15. Hey, what are you doing? He squealed in my grip. I wrapped my hands around his shoulders and locked him in. The coldness of his skin against my face was familiar. It was a minute before Independence Day, giving him time to witness it like they all did. I waited it out with him. He didn't struggle. I sensed as the fear of death paralyzed him. His utmost horror was my delight, and I relished it. Please don't, don't kill me. I, I won't trouble you again. I, 
He pleaded as the sparks flew, and then the country was thrown into a frenzy of celebrations. It was too late. I drew the blade across his neck quickly, and his vessels of blood squirted. Large sprays came out as he collapsed to the ground. He reached his hands out and groped it as I replaced the knife into my bag and wiped the blood stains from my fingers. He wouldn't make it. I knew it. So I turned away from him and continued down my way to the alley. The news the next morning was predictable as always. The news anchor would give some short detail of his life, name and age, and perhaps some family history. But most importantly, how he was now another victim of my blade on Independence Eve. <laughs>